This is the Earth Science Classroom. This video is on Earth's climate. It's in the atmospheric science playlist. I'm looking at the formation of climate, what is climate defined as, and the factors that go into controlling a climate for a certain part of the world. So climate is complex and it is controlled or affected by various factors. Now these factors can vary in number, but I have condensed it into the five that I feel we can really discuss. And these five are the latitude and temperature, the combination of water and temperature, and moisture, how close you are to water, a lake or an ocean, and the elevation, how high the surface is above sea level, the orographic effect, and also the generic air mass where the air is coming from and the properties or characteristics of that air mass can dictate climate. So climate is defined as the average atmospheric conditions for a certain location on the planet's surface, whether it be mostly on the continents, land masses versus the oceans, but there are oceanic, obviously climatic conditions, for over a 30 year period. Now, obviously, the longer you study the atmospheric conditions day by day to get a more conclusive and longer reaching study, the more accurate the climate will be in terms of the air mass and the prevailing wind and humidity. However, a shorter period would give a less consistent picture of the atmosphere. Now, this is based on certain locations, so even going over, to, going over a few kilometers or miles across the surface can change the climate completely based on certain factors. And these factors we'll get onto in this video. So our planet is heated through two main sources of energy. The first source, which is not really as apparent, with the climate system is the internal heat inside the Earth. This derives from the decay of radioactive materials inside the mantle and the core and the crust that slowly break down and release energy. Now the other form is from primordial heat and the accretion of the Earth and the heat that was stored in the formation of our planet about 4.5 billion years ago. This heat is being released slowly through convection currents, and this is how our tectonic system on our surface is generated and how the constant flux and movement of our crust happens and, of course, causes volcanoes and earthquakes. So volcanoes do have an apparent and obvious effect on the climate through the effusive gases and tephra and ash clouds and change of climate both locally and regionally and occasionally the large volcanoes globally. Now the main source of energy comes from the sun and the EM spectrum and the photons that received from the sun through space. Now this is the point of discussion with this part because our Earth is not a flat surface, it is a oblate, oblate cephroid, which means it's a sphere, but it's slightly wider and fatter around the equator than it is taller north to south pole. So when the energy is received and is hitting the Earth's surface, it's not hitting a flat surface, hitting a curved surface. So the energy comes in in a straight line from the sun. However, because the curved surface of the Earth, it's going to either create a more direct and concentrated solar energy on a certain area of the surface, or it's going to spread out and become more diffused or less concentrated if it hits an area that's more curved, let's say towards the north and south pole and the higher latitudes, the further away you go from the equator, this will create a less concentrated sunlight. So it's the same energy coming from the sun. However, the Earth's surface itself is going to either spread out or keep it close and direct, and this would change the amount of solar energy, the concentration that is received on the surface. So this is how we get a generally warmer equator and generally much colder north and south polar regions on the planet. For any climate on the planet, we can look at certain attributes or certain characteristics that define a climate. So we discussed that it's a 30 year plus period of observed weather conditions, which is more of a generic pattern of what we expect. So you go to, let's say, Florida or Egypt in the summer or Texas or Northern Australia, you expect, or let's say Southern India, you expect to be warm hot conditions in the summer. If you go to Alaska or Siberia in the winter months, 
you expect to have cold conditions and cold climates. So these are generic patterns. Now, these are basically formed from the analysis of both temperature, wind, and water. Now, these two combined, temperature is going to create difference in pressure in the atmosphere, and that will create the wind and the direction of wind, and that wind will carry or have certain characteristics of where it's coming from, whether it's over land or over water, over high elevation or lower elevation. So the moisture and temperature and the pressure of the atmosphere is all connected, and this is how we look at climate. So the temperature is going to evaporate water from the surface and cause more moisture and, and humidity in the air and if there's air that's going to rise up and it's hotter with the air that's rising air molecules through the troposphere it's going to get to a point where it's going to hit the dew point and create clouds and weather systems and uh, precip so these two plus the wind are combined together to form our climate system and beyond that if you have a certain temperature plus a certain amount or level of water or precip, whether it be rain, sleet, snow, or ice, you're going to dictate the landscape through weather and erosion. You're going to dictate the biome with the ecosystem and the biological processes that happen there with the soil amount or level or thickness with the vegetation and the flora and the fauna all connected from this climatic system, which is caused by the temperature and the water combination. Another factor of how we create or how we form a climate is the proximity of that location to water. Now, in terms of water, looking at a big body of water, meaning a huge lake or especially an ocean or a sea. A sea is a coastal part of an ocean, which is next to enclosed by partly land or coastline. So the oceans are salt water, obviously, and lakes are generally fresh water and stuff and rivers. But water has a special characteristic of having a high specific heat capacity, which means that it takes a lot of energy from the sun to be absorbed into that water molecule to break the bonds to make it evaporate into water vapor. And around 4,100 joules of energy is required to raise that water by one degree Celsius. So in comparison to land-based materials, soil is around 730 to 2,000 joules, rock, generally heat up by one degree is around 134 so water being a very unique material on this on this planet in terms of its characteristics is extremely hard to heat up so it's done for a reason you don't want the uh every sunny day for the entire oceans to evaporate and rain it would destroy everything on land so water was or is or the way water works chemically is that it's hard to evaporate, but when it does evaporate, it does contain a lot of energy. It's called latent heat or sensible heat. Now, when this heat goes into the atmosphere, this is what drives our climate and the release of energy through condensation at the dew point and LCL, creating these massive storms and thunderstorm clouds and this, and this rise in air and this thermal expansion, you get these beautiful cloud systems which come from this large amount of stored energy within the water on the surface to begin with. So if you are close to an ocean, it's going to regulate and be more consistent with the temperature because it takes longer for the water to heat up. If you go to the ocean, let's say early in the spring in the Northern Hemisphere, the water is generally cold. If you go later on in the summer, after a long summer of heating, the water is generally warmer. So if you're close to the ocean, it's going to be more consistent. Again, it's going to have more moisture, so perhaps more rain, more precip, like in Seattle, Washington, US, or in Western Europe, like where I'm from in Cornwall, where it always rains every day, pretty much. If you are away from the water, you're in the center of a massive continent, like in Asia, or in Russia, or in the central part of, of the United States, or Canada, or even Africa, you are far away hundreds or thousands of kilometers or miles from an ocean, the temperature is going to be more wide range. It's going to be a, a hotter day and a colder night. It's going to be less regulated by the temperature of the water that's not there. So it's a, a, a wider range of temperature if you are further away from the oceans. And this is called continentality. So the seasons become more extreme, the summer becomes hotter, and the winter becomes colder. So on our land masses, on our continents, on our land versus ocean, we have different elevations, different heights of the surface above sea level. 
So you can go from the coastal areas of a few meters above sea level up to the high mountain ranges like the Himalayas or Rockies or Andes where you are thousands of feet, thousands of meters above sea level. Now this is going to change the climate. You can have microclimates or regional climates based on these mountainous terrains and plateaus. But generally when you go up into the atmosphere higher on the surface, you are going to make the atmosphere colder through adiabatic cooling. Now, this generally is a rule of thumb where by every 100 meters, you go down in temperature by one degree. So if you go up a thousand meters or a kilometer, it's 10 degrees Celsius. So you can have this general rule of thumb. Now, this can change and fluctuate based on location and other factors, but generally this is what happens. So when you have an air mass that's being lifted up, it's going to cool down and it'll cool down to the point where it hits the dew point, uh, relative humidity and saturation points. This will cause clouds. So if you go up over a mountain and you form clouds on one side of the mountain, the air is going to keep going and it rains on one side, but the other side is dry. It's called a rain shadow. This is called the orographic effect or or orographic relief of precipitation. So it's going to rain on one side and then the mountain is going to cause there to be pre precip on one side and the other side is going to be drier, hotter, less water vapor and cause a rain shadow. This is going to cause deserts to form on the leeward side of the mountain or mountain range. Whereas the windward side, which is going to have the wind rising with the water vapor, is going to have more precip than the leeward side. So I mentioned earlier about wind. It's the movement of air between low and high pressure, which is caused by a change in temperature. The temperature is hot, the air is going to rise and cause low pressure on the surface, dragging in air to replace it. And if air is sinking and cold, it's going to sink down to the surface and cause high pressure and push air away. Either way, it's going to cause air to move across the Earth's surface, and this is called wind. The wind can change based on the pressures and location from low nothing wind up to gale force winds and hurricanes. So the wind and the air mass, the generic air where it comes from the wind, is going to dictate a lot of the climate. So for example, if the wind comes off the ocean, it's called maritime, and it's going to be wet and full of generally more water vapor, compared to if the air comes off a continent or a land mass where there is less severely less water, maybe some lakes or rivers, but definitely less water than the ocean, it's going to be drier. So this is a continental kind of air mass, drier, versus the maritime or ocean, which is wetter. Then you get wet the latitude or the area of the Earth it's coming from. So if it's coming from the equator, it will be hotter in general and be more what's called tropical air mass. If it's coming from the polar region, it will be generally colder, coming from North or South Pole, depends on the hemisphere you are in, it's going to be generally colder. And then in extreme situations, you might have Antarctic air or Arctic air, which is extremely dry due to the pressure over the poles and extremely cold. So where the air mass comes from is going to dictate its characteristics. So if you combine the location or the latitude of the air mass, where it's coming from, plus the level or amount of moisture or water vapor in the air, which is oceanic or continental, you get this generic air mass and the characteristics that can dictate the precip, the temperature, and therefore the climate. So as an overview, our climate on this planet is a very complex and ever-changing system. You have the short-term changes of wind direction, temperature, day and night, seasonal changes, the tilt changes, the Melanchthon cycles, the tectonic changes over a long period of time with mountain ranges, ranges and orogeny versus uh, supercontinents and like Pangaea splitting up and coming together, Rodinia. You have ocean basins, uh, sea level rise. You have changes in atmospheric composition like CO2, like we're experiencing now with a rise in, rise in CO2. And all this is a very complex system, plus it's over a large planetary system and how it all works. But we can see general characteristics within certain areas and discuss climate in terms of the temperature, the air mass, the precipitation, and the creation of landscapes based on these attributes. How hot it is, how much water there is, rain, evaporation, 
and where the area is coming from. And this will dictate the biome, it will dictate the landscape, whether an erosion, the changes of geomorphology, plus the availability of nutrients and the flora and fauna for ecosystems. Thank you so much for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like it, please subscribe and hit the like button. If you like more on this content, please check out my channel, which has all these videos on earth science.